the most crushingly disappointing failure I have ever had in my professional life turned into the launching pad for my laboratory to spin out six companies that have been funded to the tune of $180 million. These companies are already changing people's lives. Now, how the heck did that happen? At my lab, we're all about harnessing our imaginations to dream up ideas for new technologies that have never been achieved. I'd say we get excited pretty easily, and sometimes we are vulnerable to letting our enthusiasm run away with us, and that has led us down the wrong path. Several years ago, one of the first big ideas we dreamed up was in the area of stem cell therapy. We wanted to see if we could infuse cells into a patient's bloodstream and then program those cells to travel anywhere they needed to go. Imagine specially programmed stem cells that could travel to the bones to treat osteoporosis or wounds to accelerate healing or to the gut to alleviate inflammatory bowel disease or to the joints to treat arthritis. The possibility seemed limitless. Well, for the men and women at my lab, the idea of programmed stem cell therapy was too exciting to leave in the wouldn't it be cool stage. So in 2007, as the first major project in my brand new lab, we decided to try this for real. And by 2009, we had made some exciting progress. I called a local investor and described how we were able to improve the homing of infused cells to sites of inflammation. He agreed to meet to talk about the possibilities. I saw a big future. I was really excited. I described the technology and our data. Of course, what I hoped to hear was, congratulations, Jeff. You and your team are about to change the world. Earls, Earls, <laughs> Earls. But that's not what happened. Not even close. He said, look, Jeff. This will make a great academic paper, but it's just too complicated for us to fund. It's too risky. Needless to say, I was kind of devastated. Our last two years of work, the first major project in my lab, looked like a complete failure. We had developed a complex process that worked but we hadn't even considered all the challenges that our invention would face en route to the commercial marketplace. How could we have made such a basic mistake? Well, there are a couple of reasons. The first place that we fell short was that, without realizing it, we had bought in to a giant myth. In academia, there's an unwritten code that the more complex you can make something and succeed, the more recognition you can secure by publishing in a high-impact journal, for example. So there's a premium on complexity. But there's another reason we didn't get the reaction we had hoped for. <coughs> Naively, I had always thought that the hard part was getting something to work in the lab, and the rest would be taken care of by the entrepreneurs or companies that licensed our technologies. Surely they'd be able to take what we did and quickly bring it to patients. Right? Wrong. I was totally wrong. That investor taught us an important lesson. If you want to translate your vision into medical practice, you will need to come up with simpler approaches. Now, on first hearing, this may sound like the investor was advocating the KISS principle. Does anyone know what that stands for? Keep it simple, stupid. But the investor wasn't saying dumb it down. He was making a different point altogether. In 1977, Apple Computer's first slogan was, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. That quote is often credited to Leonardo da Vinci and has become a credo of a generation of aerospace engineers. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Why is that idea so powerful? Let me answer that question 
with a metaphor. Lots of brilliant engineers can build a rocket to the moon with a $1 trillion budget and 10 million custom-made parts. But to build a working moon rocket with a limited number of only off-the-shelf components, well, that takes more than brilliance. That takes genius. We could quibble over the numbers, but that's the kind of simplicity the investor was referring to. He showed us that the more complex our technologies, the more difficult they'd be to manufacture and do quality control at each step. And that means more costs. And the higher the costs, the greater the risk to investors, and the less likely our great idea would ever be able to help anyone. After I had time to absorb this in, I shook off the disappointment, rolled up my sleeves, and got to work. I put a ton of thought into how we could adopt this approach. And from that initial disappointment, and all the passion and the pain, our principle of radical simplicity was born. This is how we turned failure into success, came up with actionable solutions, and secured all of those millions of dollars in funding. Radical simplicity is the art and discipline of reducing a problem to its essence so you can solve it quickly in a way that can be practical in the real world. The secret is, the secret, is to put all of your deep, complex, nuanced thinking into breaking down and defining the problem in the simplest possible terms. Believe it or not, that is the hardest part. Now, sometimes you need to start from the complex to get to a proof of concept and then simplify as much as possible. And sometimes you need to accept a certain degree of complexity as a necessary evil. But radical simplicity is all about cutting through the chaos to uncover what we need to learn to construct a viable solution. It's all about the insights that we gain along the way. I have never worked on a problem where we understood it from the beginning. And I strongly believe that overly complex solutions are the direct result of not spending enough time or effort to define the problem. This principle has helped us to come up with effective approaches for everything from skin allergies to arthritis. Radical simplicity applies to all fields, not just biomedical engineering labs. Radical simplicity is based on three key questions. First, do we understand the territory? Start by understanding the best result that anyone has ever achieved for the problem that you're focused on. This shows you the threshold that you need to surpass to get your colleagues, investors, partners, and the public excited and engaged. That's your target. Understanding the territory also means asking why previous approaches led to poor outcomes. What are the most likely reasons that others failed to completely address the problem? Then it's all about constructing models to test how you can address each of those failure points. And for this to work, you need to narrow the territory of possibilities by making testable assumptions and taking leaps of faith. It's during this process that insights emerge for a radically simple solution. Second, radical simplicity asks, what filters should we apply? Filtering means we need to eliminate ideas by thinking in extremely practical terms about how our clever idea is going to be put into practice. You need to bake these filters in right from the beginning, not wait till the end and then tack on practicality as an afterthought. For example, in my lab, we eliminate ideas if we don't have a clear road to securing a patent or to manufacturing our technology. If we can't come up with a practical solution, we go back to defining the territory. Our brilliant idea is not brilliant enough yet to be radically simple. Third, radical simplicity means asking, how do we know we're on the right track? And the answer is constant feedback. When you're laser focused on solving a problem, you can be vulnerable to overlooking something. You need fresh eyes to look at what you've been working on and test your thinking. This principle has been used in all kinds of industries. Consider Pixar. 
Yes, Pixar, the incredibly successful animation studio that brought us Toy Story, The Incredibles, and so many others. Pixar has the world's best animators and storytellers and directors, yet they all know that the first version of any of their movies will suck. These are their words, not mine. So instead of only showing finished films to test audiences, they show partially completed films and scenes to many groups of people throughout the entire filmmaking process. And they are very, very, very systematic about this. Well, if it's good enough for Pixar, it's got to be good enough for us. To test our ideas, we have assembled a group of highly specialized experts from a variety of fields from outside our lab. They know how to put our ideas and plans in the pressure cooker and provide feedback to see if we've left anything out or made any assumptions that we shouldn't have. They are our fresh eyes, our test audience. So that's radical simplicity. Fully understand the territory, filter with practicality in mind, and road test your ideas with feedback right from the get-go. After our stem cell project had died, we attempted to put radical simplicity into practice for the very first time. We resurrected our dream for a stem cell therapy, but this time, this time, we defined the territory to include the manufacturing, which we had left out before. And this was critical for problem definition. To keep the manufacturing challenge as low risk as possible, we started by selecting from the simplest available materials. To filter with the patent landscape in mind, I developed a good working relationship with our patent office. Doing something simpler than others can help us to secure patents. To manage execution and feedback, I began by developing feedback relationships. Feedback relationships with lawyers, entrepreneurs, innovators, reimbursement and regulatory experts, and many others. Their input can help us to develop our filters and help us to identify potential partners for our technology. Our first attempt at radical simplicity gave us the results we had been hoping for. We developed a cell engineering strategy that only used a single step. We licensed it to a biotech company that has plans to bring it to market in the coming years. Not bad for Radical Simplicity's very first test run. As we continued to use Radical Simplicity, we were getting an education in those filters that I was telling you about. If you can build your moon rocket with off-the-shelf components, go ahead and do that. That's a big lesson that we learned while working on a small problem. One night, I noticed my ring finger was red and itchy. Was this some type of omen? A reaction to my marriage, perhaps? I researched my symptoms and realized that I was allergic, not to my marriage, but to the nickel in my wedding ring. Nickel is one of the most common causes of skin reactions, and I was part of the 9%, 9% of the world's population for whom this can be mild to debilitating. But I was surprised to find no safe and effective approaches existed to prevent this. I saw it as an opportunity for my lab. Could we develop a sunscreen-like barrier approach for contact allergies? where nickel could bind to particles on the skin surface that could easily be washed away? Being a science nerd, I immediately gravitated towards complexity. How could we synthesize a whole new material to achieve this? It's going to be amazing. I stopped myself then and there. No, 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 no. We needed to keep this simple. We turned to the list of agents that exist in all kinds of Consumer goods, like foods, exist in massive quantities and have a long history of human, in human use. I had no idea that such a list exists, but it does. And it's called the Generally Recognized as Safe list. And using anything from that list would be, well, right off the bat, easier. All right? Radically simple. 
we discovered that calcium carbonate particles, good old chalk, could effectively capture nickel ions and remain on the skin surface, allowing them to be removed with a simple water rinse. 24 months later, we published our findings. Our study was, was featured on the homepage of CNN, and people started writing in. Two years later, we had started a company and run a small successful clinical study, and one year later, we had a stable, scaled product regulated as a cosmetic being sold in pharmacies around the world. And now, now it's even available on Amazon. <laughs> Isn't that today's measure of success? <laughs> the product worked quite well for me without any ring finger inflammation, and it's been effective for about 80%, 80% of people who have tried it, including a ballerina who had been plagued by the nickel in the clasps of her shoes. People have told me that this product has given them a sense of freedom that they never had before, and it's because it's radically simple. You'd be amazed how often I think back to that critical, pivotal conversation that I had with the investor who at the time seemingly dashed my hopes. Since my lab has adopted the principles of radical simplicity, we've been able to simplify our stem cell therapy even more. We discovered small molecules that can directly target stem cells and progenitor cells in the body. No cell isolation, no cell manufacturing, and no cell delivery required. Why is that such a big deal? Because now we can use standard drugs to regenerate damaged human tissues. This radically simplified stem cell therapy is now the subject of an ongoing clinical study to help patients with chronic hearing loss. Can you imagine the gift that this would bring people? There has never been a drug that can actually restore their hearing, but we believe we're on the verge of having one. It's radically simple and frankly one of the most exciting things that we've ever done and the basis for a new company that I co-founded. And it all started with that defining moment of failure with the wise investor. When you know the territory, filter with practicality in mind, and do continual testing with feedback from a trusted network of fresh eyes, it creates a win-win-win for everyone involved. It's a win for our lab, it's a win for our investors, and most of all, it's a big win for the people we are ultimately trying to serve, the patients and the public. And that is why I strongly believe that radical simplicity opens new exciting paths to continual innovation in all fields. As Apple, Da Vinci, and the aerospace engineers like to say, when it comes to technology, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So if your dream is to create big breakthroughs that help real people in the real world, I invite you to try something truly radical. Embrace the sophistication of simplicity. Thank you.